Today, we're reviewing Air Street's sixth annual State of AI report, and boy, is it a doozy. For the last six years, Air Street Capital has been putting out an annual State of AI report. Now, if you're like me, these reports don't necessarily contain new information, because obviously, if you're here listening to a daily AI show, you're probably really up to speed on the developments that have happened. So rather than a catch-up, what I think this type of report is useful for is as a summarization and almost a zoom-out of what the most important things that happened are. It's a forest for the trees sort of force that allows us to make sure we don't get lost in the weeds of any given news cycle. The areas they focus on are research, industry, politics, safety, and then they give a set of predictions. And so what we're going to do on today's show is look briefly through what they consider the most significant events in each of these characters. Again, research, industry, politics, and safety. And I'll talk a little bit about where I agree, or perhaps in some cases disagree. So first up in the research section, they write, GPT-4 is out and it crushes every other LLM and many humans. Now, this is actually something that if you listen to last weekend's long reads typed episodes, we discussed a lot how GPT-4 has set the tone for the entire year. That, in fact, the phase that we are in of artificial intelligence has in some ways been defined by ChatGPT's GPT-3.5 and GPT-4. There's a sense that many have, for example, Professor Ethan Mollock, who I read from last week, that when we get to something that exceeds GPT-4, which there is some speculation that Google's Gemini might be the first thing to do so, that we will have entered a different era. I tend to think that that's true, that we are coming up on the end of this inflection phase of generative AI. Now, of course, what that means and what comes next is something we could talk about a lot, but let's move to their other summarizations. Next up, they write, fueled by ChatGPT's success, reinforcement learning from human feedback becomes MVP. Now, this one I actually want to pair with another assessment of theirs from a little bit farther on, which is researchers rushing to find scalable alternatives to RLHF. So this is sort of a two-part assessment. The first, how important RLHF has been to the training process, how it has become the default, but second, how it clearly has real significant limitations, some of which have been coming up with more frequency. Now, they're mostly focused in this section on the scalability issues regarding RLHF, which of course are quite clear. The larger the model, the harder it is to get humans to actually engage with it in that way. But even beyond that, this year has seen a growing focus on ethical issues surrounding reinforcement learning. Specifically, the impact to people often in developing economies who weren't necessarily prepared for what they were going to have to deal with and who had really significant mental consequences because of it. Now, the next thing they noted was how, with more advanced models, there has been a move away from openly sharing research. They write, OpenAI published a technical report on GPT-4 where it didn't disclose any useful information for AI researchers, signaling the definitive industrialization of AI research. Google's Palm 2 technical report suffered the same fate, while Anthropic didn't bother releasing a technical report for its Claude models. Now, AI explicitly pointed to this in that GPT-4 technical report. It identified the competitive landscape as well as the safety implications as the reason that it gave so little information. I think this is obviously a much bigger trend and something that has absolutely defined this year is the shift to a much more hyper-competitive landscape where all of the big companies along with all of the leading startups have been getting increasingly closed and competitive rather than open and collaborative. The big exception to that is, of course, and perhaps unexpectedly, Meta's Llama. Now, one of the things that I think historians will review when they look back at this key point in the history of artificial intelligence is how Mark Zuckerberg's Meta became the company that was the leading voice in trying to have more open source artificial intelligence. I think an interesting question within that is the extent to which it was a master plan based on principle, or was itself in some ways a response to seeing the growing competitive landscape and sensing that there was an opportunity to fill that role as other companies like OpenAI ironically got more closed. Now, even though Llama was open source, the State of AI report also notes, I think correctly, that to the extent that this year saw a growing arms race in closed models, so too was there growing competition around open models. They point to Falcon 40B, Red Pajama, and more recently Mistral AI's 7B model. Interestingly, they identified that based on mentions on X, ChatGPT and GPT-4 were the most discussed models, followed by Llama and Llama 2. They also argued that while closed source models get the most attention, there has been an increase in interest in open source LLMs, especially those that allow commercial use. The team found that since the end of last year, RLHF and instruction tuning have been the most trending topic. And they point out that another big shift this year has been the new attention paid to context length. Indeed, they write context length is the new parameter count. I think in many ways, one of Anthropic's biggest boons this year was its introduction of a 100K model, even if in practice, there are still some challenges with it. 
Another discussion on the rise that they notice is the question of whether we're running out of human-generated data and what it will mean for the training of future models. They discuss that even as synthetic data seems to be becoming more helpful, there is still, as they put it, evidence showing that in some cases generated data makes models forget. I tend to think that this is going to be one of the biggest points of exploration for the industry over the next year. Remember, Meta had that hugely intriguing little chart when it released Llama 2 that suggested that an unreleased model that was trained with synthetic data actually outperformed the model that was trained on non-synthetic data. But we haven't really heard much more about it since then. They point out that even as societal interest in things like watermarking to help determine what has been AI created becomes more important, watermarking technology itself has some real challenges. Another trend that they identify that I think is going to be hugely important, they call Welcome Agent Smith. LLMs are learning to use software tools. The most obvious tool they write is a web browser allowing a model to stay up to date, but practitioners are fine-tuning language models on API calls to enable them to use virtually any possible tool. If you've paid any attention to this channel, you'll have heard me talk about how much interest there is in AI agents, and that I think is directly in line with this observation, and I think is going to define a huge amount of what we see coming next year. Now, there are just a ton of other things in this research section alone. There's a discussion of vision language models, autonomous driving, foundation models for robotics, a discussion of the text-to-video generation race, a little bit of nerfs, a whole discussion of medical AI. Overall, there's nearly 70 slides just on the research piece alone. Now, what about the industry section? Perhaps unsurprisingly, right at the top is a discussion of compute and how much it has impacted the first great big public market winner in the AI space, which is, of course, NVIDIA. They discuss the GPU shortage, which has been, of course, a significant factor in shaping how the AI field has developed this year, and point out that access to GPUs has been a key differentiator for certain startups. Interestingly, they take that famous phrase, X is the new oil, and apply compute to it, which I think many people will agree with, but specifically put it in the context of the Gulf states themselves, who are making increasingly aggressive moves to have access to advanced compute at a hugely significant level. One interesting slide discusses what we talked about in yesterday's show, which is that Tesla is, at least for them, quietly marching towards having one of the largest compute clusters in the world. And they explore what use cases have been most significant for this new set of generative AI applications. They point to education as something that was disrupted almost immediately, the incredible shifts happening in the way that people code. They have some conversation that relates to today's brief around customized chatbots and AI characters. And of course, they talk about the intensifying competition around text to image models. In that context, of course, they point out that copyright infringement issues and questions are being fought on multiple legal fronts and could have significant impact on how some of these models develop over the next couple years. The other big trend they notice, which is something we've talked about frequently on this show, is that generative AI has really been the last bastion in some ways of the ZERP era venture capital world, although how long that can last remains to be seen. Now, we'll move a little more quickly through their politics and safety sections, given that basically the entirety of the politics section is identifying that the world is really divided on how to handle this, and that when it comes to global governance, it's still in its very early stages because there just isn't a lot of agreement yet. Now, what that's created is a vacuum in which industry self-regulation efforts have arisen, although how far those efforts get remains to be seen. The other big dimension of politics that they talk about is, of course, the new front in U.S.-China economic and strategic tensions in which the U.S. has blocked access to China as much as possible around a lot of advanced AI inputs. Finally, when it comes to safety, they identify something that has been one of the biggest themes for us this year, which is, of course, that the X-risk debate has exploded into the mainstream. Around this, obviously, it has added a new dimension to this open versus closed source debate. Indeed, this is increasingly becoming wrapped up in the question of AI safety and X-risk. Now, for those of you who are interested in actual approaches to and trends in how people are thinking about addressing different risks associated with AI, the trends that they list in this report are actually very interesting. They have a section, for example, on Anthropic's constitutional AI and self-alignment. They ask how hard is scalable supervision. And ultimately, this is a great starting point if you want to understand how many people in the space are thinking about these issues. What about predictions? Predictions are always the most fun in some ways. So they have 10 here. I'll go through them quickly and then I'll double tap on a couple. One, a Hollywood-grade production makes use of generative AI for visual effects. Two, a generative AI media company is investigated for its misuse during the 2024 U.S. election circuit. Three, self-improving AI agents cross soda in a complex environment. Four, tech IPO markets on thaw, and we see at least one major listing for an AI-focused company, e.g. Databricks. Five, the Gen AI scaling craze sees a group spend over a billion dollars to train a single large-scale model. 
Six, the U.S.'s FTC, or U.K.'s CMA, investigate the Microsoft OpenAI deal on competition grounds. Seven, we see limited progress on global AI governance beyond high-level voluntary commitments. Eight, financial institutions lost G- launch GPU debt funds to replace VC equity dollars for compute funding. Nine, an AI-generated song breaks into the Billboard Hot 100 Top 10 or the Spotify Top Hits 2024. 10. As inference workloads and costs grow significantly, a large AI company, e.g. OpenAI, acquires an inference-focused AI chip company. I think some of these are nearly guaranteed. Hollywood-grade production making use of generative AI, for example, definitely going to happen. I think when it comes to music, I'm not sure that we'll get a top 10 hit, but I do think that we'll see the first platform that is sanctioned by musicians and labels that allows people to use artists' likenesses and voices on tracks that are then allowed to be played in normal arenas. One of the most interesting ones to me, if in some ways the more boring on the face of it, is this idea that financial institutions will launch GPU debt funds to replace VC equity dollars for compute funding. I think this one has a very high likelihood of happening. We're already seeing compute and access to compute being used as a lever for venture capitalists to attract better deals. And I think that seeing a subsection of funders that are specifically dedicated exclusively to the economics of providing access to compute is very, very likely to happen. I also think that there's a natural state that happens with venture capital funding, where when you start to see areas that aren't just generalist development, but are specific cost centers, such as access to cloud services, paid customer acquisition, or now compute, you tend to get specialized funders. Anyway, overall, there is a ton in here. It is really worth taking even more time to dig into it. Thanks to the folks at Airstreet, especially Nathan Beinock, who's the primary author, for what must have been a ton of work putting this all together. That's going to do it for today's AI Breakdown. Until next time. Peace.